Good afternoon. I can tell you, having spent some time with our panelists in preparation, that you are in for a remarkable conversation. Um, and we're delighted to have you here. Uh, my name is Henry Johnson. I am the Chief Operating Officer for Wealth Management uh, at Northern Trust. And over the course of my career, I've actually had the privilege of working with a number of collectors, collections, artists, and artist estates. Um, and I'm both fascinated by this topic um, and delighted to have uh, a group of such extraordinary caliber to lead this conversation. Um, I, we are delighted to have you here with us at Expo Chicago, the 2023 edition, which is the 10th year since Expo was reborn, if you will. Um, and uh, we are, of course, as Northern Trust, delighted to be the presenting sponsor again this year. Um, the goal of the conversation today is to provide practical guidance uh, for those not only faced with the task of revisiting their acquisitions as collectors, but also considering the collections and even the individual works, potential impact and legacy. Um, our panelists today, uh, there are five, but it will be moderated um, by Christina Evans at the end from, uh, who is the US correspondent for the Financial Times, a copy of which is on all of your chairs. Uh, and I have to say the FT does remarkable work in terms of arts coverage. Uh, but together, uh, we have Roberta Kramer, uh, the Vice President and Managing Director of Heritage Auctions here in Chicago. If you don't know Heritage, it is an extraordinarily fine auction house headquartered here doing really magnificent work. Michael Darling, who is the co-founder of Museum Exchange, which is a fascinating uh, enterprise in its own right, which I'll let you speak about. My colleague, Elisa Shevlin Rizzo. Elisa and I have worked together for the last 20 years, and she has remarkable perspective and has, uh, has really developed a core expertise in the world of art law. Um, has something to say today about that. And then finally, Anne-Marie Trahan from Arsenal Contemporary um, in uh, Montreal, Toronto, and New York. Uh, Emery and her husband have created a quite remarkable space uh, in Montreal with satellites in the two other cities I mentioned that is uh, a place to uh, enliven the conversation around contemporary art, both through the lens of Canadian contemporary artists, but much more globally. And I think as collectors and thinking about space and the intent not only of w the work that they have collected, but the artists that they work with and the importance of that in the communities that they live in, I think will bring a really unique voice to our panel today. So with that, I just want to turn it over to Christina. Thank you all for joining us. You are in for a real treat. Yes, thank you for being here. Uh, so I think this will be a wide-ranging conversation. Um, there are so many different elements that we all bring to the table um, that we can touch upon. But maybe we start with Elisa. Um, doing trust and estates work. What are you seeing now? What are some of the challenges? I know things are changing in terms of taxation, things you know, from region to region. What are some of the family situations that you're seeing now? So um, I've been privileged to work with a number of collectors during their lifetime to plan for their collection, do their estate planning work, set up irrevocable trusts. I've also been honored to work with many situations where the collector has passed away and there's a collection that's being managed at death. And individual beneficiaries are receiving items. Some things might be going to charity. Other things might be going to sale. Um, so having these conversations with the client always has to start with what do you have before we can begin planning. And I will tell you, I am always surprised by how often our clients and prospects don't have a good inventory they don't have a good list of the objects. Maybe there was an appraisal done, but it was done in 1989. Um, they collect things on the go, and they don't keep their records up to date. From a planning perspective, that's where I always start. Where are we beginning? Um, because we need to understand what objects or items might be subject to the plan before we can develop the plan for those. Um, once we've got a sense of what there is to work with and that we need to plan for, I then ask about family, individual beneficiaries who might be interested in the collection. Um, that's where people usually start. They assume that the collection will pass on down to their kids or grandkids. And um, I always ask the question, have you talked to them about it? Um, because unfortunately, oftentimes, the collectors learn that their children or grandchildren don't necessarily share the same passion for the objects that they did. 
And it's all different kinds of collections. It's great works of art, it's stamp collections, coin collections. I had one client who had a collection of baseball cards um, that they had acquired over time and they had so much joy in building the collection. Um, and maybe they hadn't been able to really transfer that joy onto their kids or spouse or grandkids. Um, maybe those individuals don't really understand the value of the collection, not just the financial value, but the emotional value. So having a thoughtful conversation about what the family wants is always the first starting point. Then we can talk about other kinds of planning, and that's where charitable gifts often come into play. Um, is there a charitable organization that the donor or the collector really is a favorite of his or hers? Um, are there works that they feel deserve to be on public display in perpetuity? Do they want to try and keep the collection together? It, it, it opens up a whole other level of conversation. And again, then we have the conversation about have you talked to any of the organizations that you want to work with about your collection? Because before you can set any plans in place, those conversations have to happen first. Um, and then in the background of all of it, we're always thinking about taxes, we're thinking about liquidity needs, we're thinking about the cost of maintaining the collections. But when we start planning, it always starts with a conversation of what do you have, who do you want to benefit, and have you had a discussion with any of them? Excellent. Um, Roberta, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of popularity at Heritage and what people are really interested in collecting right now. So there's all these emerging categories that probably are a ways off, I think, from being applicable in estate planning. Video games. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if anybody saw yesterday's New York Times about the you know, VHS tape, I actually have a VHS player, <laughs> it's just like, but that sold for, you know, $27,000. Just a rocky, you know, seal, that's all. We see sneaker collections, we see um, all the traditional categories as well, but you know, we've hit records like 1.56 million on a Super Mario Brothers. I don't think, I think we're a ways off and that we'll all be retired hopefully somewhere on a nice island when that comes to pass. So what we see on the estate side, because of course we deal with many <coughs> estates and Elisa's point is well taken, many not planned very well, is increasingly as people live longer, their children are much older when their parents pass. They have often, they have grandchildren. They've downsized mm -hmm. already. Even if they have some attachment to the parents' collection, they're not taking most of it, right? They'll take one or two things. And often they're not the high dollar, if you will, things. It's a, there's a sentimental attachment or meaning to it from when they were growing up. But that's it. And that more often than not, what we hear from people who are in the downsizing phase, in their 90s perhaps, moving into assisted living arrangements or into a condo from a giant house, is my children don't want my stuff. Mm -hmm. And grandchildren, even less. So in those, cat those types of situations, we're seeing all the traditional things that have always been there, you know, fabulous fine art collections, beautiful silver, coins, and coins is interesting, because we do see stamp collections. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, and I can't explain it, stamps, there's almost no market left. Interesting. Um, but coins are collected by younger people. And therefore, this is a collection category that continues on, but not, not the stamps. So it, in the, when somebody comes to us, you know, in hopefully working in partnership <laughs> with a good planner and tax person and attorney, we have the same conversations. Is they, They'll tell me all the time here in Chicago, I'm leaving my collection to the Art Institute. And I say the same thing. I'm like, do they know? <laughs> <laughs> because unfortunately, 99.9 .9 times out of 100, the Art Institute doesn't want 
is collection. Museums increasingly have space constraints, money issues to take care of what they already do have. And so we try to help people think about if they want, instead of selling something, if they want to be charitable, how about alternatives? Where did you go to school? Do they have a museum? Mm -hmm. Where did your kids go to school? Or my, you know, our, our favorite, why don't we sell this and give the money mm -hmm. to the charity? And that's the other thing, with, even with beneficiaries. Money is really easy to divide. Right. Stuff is really hard. And the worst thing somebody can do is when I hear, I'm leaving this million dollar painting to my five grandchildren. <laughs> Oh no. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Correct. No. Well, that's a nice segue to Michael, I think, in terms of you you saw an unmet need in terms of matching patrons with institutions. Tell, tell us a little bit about Museum Exchange and some of the pairings that you've made. Yeah, I mean, just building on what Roberta said, you know, of course, museums are increasingly selective about what they take as, as gifts. Um, they are out of storage. Um, they, but they also, you know, have, they're redefining their mission. And so to take just anything is not an option anymore. And I've, I'm finding a lot of donors that have traditionally given to their local museum, or the, that museum is starting to say no to them. And so where do they turn in that situation? And that's really one of the, the places where museum exchange can help because we've built this network of museums, small and large, all across the country. And we can find a museum where that object would really make a difference and, and, and have an impact. And the, you know, to get back to your, the core of your question too, you know, the museums, like I said, are redefining their mission. They're, most of them have predominantly white male collections. So they're, they're really trying to diversify in terms of bringing more women into the conversation of the art history they're trying to put on view, artists of color. And so, um, you know, there's a certain band of art art collecting that's kind of irrelevant. Like art art collect art artists and kind of movements of sorts that were super hot, you know, a few years ago, that museums just don't even want to touch. So, it um, so that's something I think to consider. And, and where I'm really ex interested, especially in a con context like this, is trying to narrow that gap between what the marketplace is telling you to buy and where it's eventually going to go because you either can sell it or you give it to a museum and if not you're you're stuck with this thing right so what's hot now what what are you the most uh, you, know, you know uh, artists of color for sure again because museums are desperate to try to re to rejigger the, the the math in their collections and to be able to to represent uh, art that their audiences you know can can see themselves in and and women artists have been historically excluded from the story so you see it kind of going backwards like going back into the 40s and the 50s when it was all the white guys bringing some of the women that were in the story back into the picture we're seeing that of course in the marketplace but also so in museums and then, uh, you know, looking for artists that I'd say also art that tells a story that has a discursive quality. So it can't just be a pretty picture. It's got to also help us deal with the things that are the complexities of our world. Uh, so it's that kind of art that I think also is, is very much in, in demand. Is there a specific painting or object that you have paired with an institution recently where you're like, okay, that's a great fit. They wanted it to go to MoMA, but... It's going to the Des Moines Museum. Des Moines is awesome. We, we, we love we love Des Moines. Um, <laughs> um, there's there's a there's a couple slides of of from Museum Exchange kind of circulating in there. But one one of them that's there, which is I think a great example, is the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, mm -hmm. and they just did this amazing new building that opened last year, an extension. They've been collecting all this time while the building was under under uh, construction, and they have a great gallery devoted to kind of all the titans of the the 50s and the 60s. So there's Clifford Still in there and Motherwell and had Reinhardt and all kinds of people like that. And they, right in the middle of the gallery is a Richard Hunt sculpture from the 50s that they got from us. And they didn't have, they had some prints and works on paper by Richard Hunt, for those of you that don't know, a great African-American artist based here in Chicago. And this incredible sculpture is in the middle of the space kind of anchoring it. So it really allows them to sort of tweak the story that they can tell and tell a much more expansive story about uh, post-war art. So that, that we, our team did a road trip down there last month and we got to see that in person. So that was, that was really rewarding for us.
great. So Anne Maria is the actual collector on the stage. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit. There we go. Oh, there you go. Uh, about <laughs> how. A piece that may be a problem, right? Well, no. <laughs> All good. Um, about maybe about a little bit about how you and your husband started as collectors, how that mission has changed to share with your gallery, and even how you plan to continue that legacy. So I think um, we've just. Oh, sorry. There we go. Hi. So I think we just entered that other side of thinking about what are we going to do with all this. Fair enough. Yeah, so it's very recent. Um, and I arrived in Chicago a few days early with my husband, and I've been, we've been discussing this in preparation. Um, conversations that we necessarily did not have to that extent before. We were so concerned about building it and making the content interesting and making Montreal like a you know, the center of contemporary art and all this, and we love art, and it's, uh, it's you know, the wonder and the discovery and all the people we meet, and it's just so amazing. Like, please, all of you join us in this journey, um, if you haven't already. And recently, we've come to this situation where we're like, hmm, that's really big. <laughs> and uh, the acquisitions were sort of, um, in function of how big our space was. The space in Montreal is in former shipyard, so the ceilings are 40 feet. There's 80,000 square feet. There's nothing we see anywhere that doesn't fit. So, um, yeah, we've got one of those collections that I think um, would be a case study. Um, we love it all. I don't think uh, there's anything that we ever acquire that we're thinking we're going to have to uh, part with. Uh, lots of thought goes into many of the pieces, lots of um, emotion, wonder, um, meeting the artists, loving their practice. Um, you know, it's like thinking of this now, I guess we have to start to think about it. Um, yes, donating to museums, we actually have museums come by and tell us, by the way, Whenever you're ready to get rid of that, we'd like that. <laughs> so yeah, we're keeping a list. Um, in terms of our Your focus a little bit. Like, so you started with contemporary. Like yeah, Indiana it's only, only contemporary. There's no modern art. And the Canadians, specifically in the beginning, and then? Specifically, in, uh, I think the, the beginning was, of course, um, mostly buying Canadian art and uh, from there, we realized also we wanted to help diffuse Canadian art that was sort of insular. Most of the Canadians' uh, artists were, uh, the market was sufficient in Canada and were not known, but the market was becoming more international in the contemporary art. So we were, you know, wanting to participate in the diffusion and help them out. And that's where we ended up in um, New York, where we're using that platform. But we realized that if we, kept the diffusion and the project just Canadian, we were actually feeding the insular again. So this is where we um, now are doing probably half and half, half Canadian, half international, um, which is allowing the conversations and the sharing of, of contacts and, you know, and hiring international curators and, um, you know, uh, inviting, case in point, we have um, an, an American artist showing at, in uh, Art Chicago. So we invited him to a residency in Montreal. And we do, right now we have uh, a Canadian artist in residency in New York. So continuing this, um, this exchange to broaden everybody's um, impact and knowledge and everything. Yeah. Terrific, thank you. Um, this will apply to some of you more than others, but how has the rise of sort of the digital platforms, particularly over these last COVID years, with like the rise of things like bring a trailer, things that have sort of impacted the, the markets, um, how has that affected your auction space? Well, <laughs> it's, it, it's, I don't know, that, I think in some ways the jury's still out, but we've, you know, the, the there's a lot that everybody read about. You know, the Board Apes Yacht Club and and the NFTs, etc. But I, I think that we, I mean, we've certainly sold them. 
Um, it, the market seems to have cooled down mm -hmm. quite a great deal. Older collectors obviously have minimal interest. Yeah. Um, and that there, it's just, it's such a broad all over the place. I, the one thing I have seen is that established artists, you know, mid career and later, who all of a sudden started producing in this new space, if you will, there, the auction market, nobody had, there, there was no interest. Mm -hmm. That it was not their medium, and that it, in some ways, we'll wait and see. The jury's still out. It may have actually damaged their markets. Interesting. Down the line, so we will we'll wait and see. I personally have not gotten overly because it's it's just I'm old. Not yeah. not my. <laughs> I'm more of a traditional art person, but our firm has certainly seen it across a number of platforms, including uh, actually especially in our comics oh, interesting. department. We have an enormous comics department, and they're, they're selling them all the time, but, but they're not $60 million, mm -hmm. right? They're, there's a very big range um, of, of prices, and we only, you know, um, the press tends to pick up on the more, you know, wow, that's a huge amount of money, mm -hmm. and not in the kind of day-to-day -day trade of like some of these NFTs and things like that. Right, right. Uh, and Michael, how about for you? Has that, is it opened your network? Has it made the donor match any easier, or is that just about your relationships, really? Well, yeah, I'll kind of take your question a little differently, which is I think um, people are so much more used to looking at JPEGs of artworks, you know, especially during the pandemic. So we've definitely seen that in, in galleries, but people selling things based on a JPEG without ever seeing it in person until it arrives at your door, of course. But, and then, and so we're, I think with the curators and museum directors that are looking at our catalogs of material, they, they're, they know how to look at things in that way. And of course, because they're, it's an old fashioned business, you know, these things still do arrive at the museum and they get inspected and they get voted upon and all of that. So that part still happens, but there's still, this um, this intermediary of the of the digital image on a website is is very natural, I think, for people now. So that's that's really been crucial to how we've been able to operate and get so many people looking at our site and and looking for artworks for their for their museum collections. Right. And Marie, would you echo that sentiment? Has it been helpful for you being online and looking at works, you know, when you haven't been able to do so in person? I think that we can only buy. Uh, Sorry, again. Hello. Um, I find we can buy a piece of art on by a JPEG, but you'd only if you already know the practice of the artist and you've seen the texture and the scale and you know you've experienced in person. It's definitely not a preferred way of purchasing art, but uh, for an artist that you know and you've been waiting for a piece and it was the pandemic or and you couldn't travel, yes, it, it has happened, but it's definitely not a a preferred way of, and NFTs, I don't think we've purchased any, have we? No. Well, and I, I just want to add that we did see a huge uptick, obviously, during the pandemic. Um, people were paying attention to their collections, whatever they collect, whether it's watches. coins or watches or, or jewelry or handbags or base, baseball cards, it doesn't matter, but that I think Emery's point is well taken. I think things like in the prints and multiples category, people are familiar with these things. You know what it is. Uh, a necklace that is made by Tiffany, you've seen it before, and you know what that is, or a bag. But the, it, it, so that's all become much easier, and I think people are much more comfortable. And even now that we've returned to you know live previews, live auctions, et cetera, we don't see as many people. People are much more comfortable now doing the actual buying and bidding online. Mm -hmm. So they'll come, they'll look, they'll have the experience, and then they're not going to get dressed and dragged downtown and sit in the auction room. 
they're very comfortable with reputable auction companies making the actual purchase online. So I'd like to go back, though, and talk a little bit about digital art, because some of you might have digital art out already. You might have bought you know, some NFTs. Maybe your kids bought a pop shots from the NBA, I think we're selling those. From a planning perspective, they're impossible to plan with, right? The structures that we use from an estate planning or a gift planning structure standpoint, they require that we are able to transfer title. I want to fund a trust during my lifetime for the benefit of my kids or a charitable trust for charity where I'm going to get back an income stream. I have to be able to transfer title to that NFT somehow to a trustee who's going to have to hold it on a platform somewhere. That raises a whole lot of issues in this blockchain technology world where the, the anonymous nature of that chain is critical to the success of the asset class. And so, you know, from our perspective, NFTs are the same as cryptocurrency, which for a bank, a corporate fiduciary, very difficult to hold on your platform. The valuations are wild. You never know what they're going to be from day to day. The risk of fraud, um, the risk of somebody getting a hold of that token, that key, and, and basically taking possession of that asset, very challenging. Um, these, are, these are the kinds of issues that I know we're going to have to grapple with at some point, because at some point, one of our clients is going to die, and they're going to own an NFT. Hopefully not the people. That one we'll plan for. <laughs> but back to my original point on planning, we need to know what you all have before we can start thinking about what the right structures are to put in place. And digital assets, because of the anonymous nature and the way they're tokenized, very, very hard to plan with. And there are a lot of people that are working on these issues, but I don't think that there are any good solutions yet um, because the issues aren't quite ripe. Right. Uh, what, are there pr particular trends right now in family coll collections that you're seeing, um, I don't know, preferences for certain types of art, trying to sell the old masters, you know, keep the contemporary? What? Yeah, I mean, I think similar to what Michael was saying and Roberta, you know, there's definitely an uh, interest in emerging artists, artists who have been underrepresented in traditional art collections. Um, you know, during the pandemic, we saw a huge uptick in the number of young collectors because, again, they're much more comfortable operating in a digital world. And so they were out there buying things online and buying edgier, newer artists and, you know, rolling the dice, see what might happen. Um, from a regional perspective, I would say on the East Coast, just anecdotally, in our, in our clients' existing collections, we tend to see more of the impressionist, um, more of the traditional type art. Um, in the West Coast, we're seeing much more postmodern, contemporary, um, street art type works. Um, so I think that that's regional. Um, but there's less of an interest in those old master. There's less of an interest in a lot of the impressionist collections. You know, showcase pieces aside, you know, those still do very well. But I would say that the trend is moving away from those traditional classes and more towards um, the emerging art or the underrepresented art. Interesting. Question for all of you about authentication and provenance, which I have to imagine is an issue, particularly in these days and times when so many things are on the no list, right? Um, how, how are you dealing with that? How does your... Well, we have, we have entire pe people whose entire job it is. And that's not just in art, although obviously it, it, art is probably the most nuanced. Right, there are all of these independent authorities for things like baseball cards mm -hmm. and grading coins and things, even video games, things that you can encase in plastic that are tamper proof and that, and, and then all of this stuff is starting to go on the blockchain, which makes perfect sense. It's, it's the part of the blockchain that makes the most sense to me, to be honest with you. But, but the art is difficult and it's, we see a lot of families whose, you know, perhaps the mother or grandmother has just passed away, and they've, oh, this is the, our Monet, and it's always been treated as a Monet, and we're like, but we need to, uh, well, here's the paper. Those papers are old, and 
we need to do it again. If there's a new, there's you, typically the catalog resume author is a very common thing. The um, the laws in in France, for instance, are end up being very different. And here, the process can be lengthy, it can be expensive, and sometimes the answer is not a Monet. Mm -hmm. And now you've got a whole another thing going on. So the 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 chain of custody in terms of provenance is extremely important in documenting and keeping track of exhibitions, et cetera. It's like Elisa was saying, if you, when the first question is, what do you have? And whether that's in, we're in the middle of a huge appraisal right now for a massive collection. Now nothing was on a computer, but this couple kept up binders. Mm -hmm. And there was, there's an invoice for every one of the 800 pieces right. we're currently working on. There's supporting information. There's menus sometimes from dinners given for artists. I mean, all that stuff is so important in helping. But in the end, if there's an authenticator that has to be addressed, mm -hmm. you, you have no choice. And you, it may take a while. And you have to do it. And it requires a lot of research to figure out who is the right person to do it for some for some artists. Right. So Michael, I suppose you're dealing with things that have been authenticated elsewhere. So is it any easier for you in terms of museum placement, or does it go through 10 more hurdles? That it's you, you know, most of what we've handled so far has been pretty contemporary work. So the, the chain of ownership has been pretty short, usually gallery to the person that we're dealing with or artist to the person. When, when there's been older, more historical work where there's more time for things to pass through more hands, then, then we really, you know, ask the donor for the, the pro well, we always ask the donor for the provenance, but we really try to get more detail on that. And then sometimes once the, mu the work gets to the museum, the museums even dig in deeper. Like there's a piece that we placed at the Art Institute recently, and um, one of the, the curatorial staff was telling me yesterday about how much research they were doing after the fact to really kind of figure out even who the people, how what the interesting parts of the lives of the people that own this before you know it got to them were, and how they kind of contributed to the artist circle. So there's some, oftentimes extra research that happens later on. Okay, I'm interested. I mean, sustainability sort of is a thread in everything these days. Is it important to Arsenal? Is it something that you think about with the artists that you work with? Mm. Um, I don't know. I, okay. I don't know. Ask. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, are your, uh, the families that you work with, which I'm guessing are multi-gen, um, are the younger generations voicing a concern about that? or? I think um, they're voicing a concern about sustainability in a lot of different facets, not necessarily with respect to the art collections um, that the family might have, but with regard to their investments and, right. and financial portfolios. I do want to go back, though, to your question on authentication, mm -hmm. because one area that I'm increasingly becoming concerned about, again, from a planning standpoint, is um, you know, what to do with those objects that people picked up during their travels in the 1950s, right? Um, you know, I was traveling in Southeast Asia, and I picked up some artifacts, or um, I'm out west, and I've got some Indian tribal masks, or um, all those different things that people picked up on their travels that may have been OK to sell back in the 50s and 60s, or you know, they think they were OK to sell or buy. We didn't know then. But today, those items are being sought back by various countries. Um, so that's, that's one thing that I'm incredibly concerned about. As we start looking at our clients' collections, it's not just the beautiful Lucien Freud hanging on the wall, right? It's the, it's the um, so tribal mask hanging next to it. It's um, the small bust of a, of a head. Um, I was actually at a prospective client's apartment a few weeks ago and was talking with them about these very issues. What do you have? What are we thinking? How can I be helpful to you? And they have a beautiful collection. And they had two small antique busks on pillars. And I, I just inquired. I said, you know, what are those? Oh, they're, they're, of, they're of Greek origin. I said, OK. You know, and they're older people. They probably picked them up 30, 40 years ago. Um, 
that's going to be something we're going to need to deal with in the planning. You know, is that object something that can be transferred mm -hmm. to a charity or to family? Is it marketable? Um, and then when you do have items that need to be returned, that, that is something that's coming up more and more often. Um, Town & Country Magazine is actually running a series um, of all the objects that are being repatriated to different countries in 2023, and they update it every couple of weeks. Um, whether it's Nazi looted art that's been discovered, it's that impressionist painting that's been hanging in someone's house, and, and now we realize that it was you know, improperly stolen or forcibly removed from a family back in the early you know, 1940s or late 1930s. What do you do with that? Um, some of these tribal pieces, um, some of the indigenous works of art. I think as older people that traveled the world tend to die, we're going to see more of these issues in, in smaller collections. Maybe not things that will hit headlines, but they give me concern. You're also going to see it's not just the potential it doesn't belong to you, it really belongs to another country that you have to give it back to. As the laws, especially these CITES laws, have changed, you're going to find um, perhaps American Indian things that have feathers on them that are no longer legal for sale. Mm -hmm. um, other materials, ivory, we've already seen it. You know, um, especially Chinese ivory, right? Can't, so can, can you pass it to your heirs? We can't, we won't sell it anymore, right? It's not okay. And, and no reputable company will. So also in terms of uh, when you're dealing with it from an estate tax perspective, you know, what do you do? Sometimes I sit there and go, well, do I just pretend it's not here? And that's kind of where I've been leaning because what can you do? So pass it down to the kid whether they want it or not. <laughs> Might be your only option. Fair enough. Um, this is a question for at least these three on the end, but um, how are you, how does Arsenal, for example, share art? Is there any sort of public loaning that you do? Or um, there's this Miami model that I've heard about where people, you know, open it up more broadly. Um, yes, well, of course, um, in Montreal, oops, sorry. <laughs> in Montreal, in Montreal, um, a quarter of the space is uh, to showcase the collection, so you come and visit the collection, like you would see some of these collections in Miami. Um, we do a lot of loaning uh, to the warning to know what you have. We have a registrar, so all pieces are totally cataloged. And uh, they know which museum has which pieces, a few of the pieces that are up there right now are at museums. Um, so yeah, there's a, that's the whole point of our project is the sharing and the diffusion. And of course, we're trying to show Canadian art, but we again are showing it in collaboration. This is Canadian art um, in collabor in, at the same time as international art. Right. Yeah, so. Great. Elisa, does it present issues for you if a family says, well, I would love my collection of Manets to go up to Yale for, you know, the next generation. Is that something that you see where they then take it back or? So there are different ways that you can share artwork with charitable organizations like Yale or the Met or whatever. Um, you know, you can embark on a lending program. That happens often, particularly if you've got a key work of art. It might be loaned out to a museum to complete a collection that might be on display. Um, we see that with some visiting collections, right? Um, there are ways that you can make gifts, um, fractional gifts of art to charity. Um, I'll be candid and I tell you I haven't seen it actually in practice very often. It's not a commonly used strategy because there aren't really good rules of the road, but the idea is that the donor who owns a piece of art can make a gift, a fractional gift of 25% of the value of the art to whatever charitable organization wants to accept it. Um, and get an immediate charitable deduction for that fractional interest, retain the right to use the property for the other fraction of the time. So if we're talking like a 25% gift, maybe the museum gets title to 25% of it, the charitable deduction is 25% of the fair market value as of the date of the gift, and then the donor can retain possession for 75% of the time. 
one caveat to that type of a fractional gift where it's a, a shared arrangement is the entirety of the piece must be transferred to the charitable organization within 10 years. So like that parting of dominion and control is really hard for collectors. Um, so that's, that's really challenging. Um, I would say that when we're talking about sharing art and getting it out into the public domain, what I see more often is charitable bequests at death as opposed to lifetime gifts to charity just because the tax planning rules for charitable lifetime gifts are so difficult to get around. There are so many restrictions. You've got to worry about the type of the property that you're gifting. You've got to worry about the type of organization that's receiving it. Is it a public charity? Is it a private foundation? The tax deduction rules vary, you know, depending on that. Um, and then you have to worry about how the organization will use it mm -hmm. um, and will that pass the related use test, which basically means the organization has to use the gifted property in a way that's related, substantially related to its mission. Um, so like the classic is a, you gift a painting to a museum and they hang it on the wall, right? That's easy. Um, that is That would pass the related use test and in that case, the donor would get a a charitable deduction based on the fair market value of the object at the date of the gift. Um, and then they could deduct that um, on their income tax returns subject to a, a limitation of 30% of their AGI in any given year. So if you've got a million dollar painting you're giving to a public charity, they're going to hang it on the wall, it passes the related use test, um, in, and you have million dollar of adjusted gross income, just to keep the math easy, in year one, you can deduct $300,000. In year two, you can deduct $300,000. It takes four years before you get to use your full charitable deduction. So that's kind of a pain, right? People don't necessarily want to worry about that. What if the charity needs to sell the piece? You're going to lose a part of your deduction. What if you want to give it to a private foundation? Um, you're going to have a different kind of deduction. So in terms of getting things to organizations and out into the public domain, I see that more at death where you're passing things on as opposed to like shared charitable gifts, like the fractional gift. Lending, we do see. That's, that's easier. Like that, you're just letting somebody borrow it for a little while. You're going to get it back. You haven't really gotten rid of it. Um, it may help to add to the provenance of the piece too. Right. It might help increase the value of the piece. So that's actually beneficial to the donor. Well, thank you all so much for this terrific conversation and thank you all for coming.